I, I just want to take a few moments this morning. We have a wonderful morning. What, what I really want to do is to make sure we get plenty of time to get our four visiting scholars from elsewhere to come up and sit here and take your questions and get into a kind of informal discussion about history because um, you know it's great to have people from distinguished institutions come out and lecture and we're so privileged to, to have that joy here in, in, at the Roosevelt Center but when you get to see them talking amongst themselves in a casual way and disagreeing but respectfully and really showing us that history is not a settled narrative, but it's an ongoing dialogue. It's a negotiation about the past. That's really important, is, is, is not to think that there is some sort of a, 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 a final narrative line on anything. That history is up for grabs, and that um, scholars who have plowed much the same ground can disagree pretty considerably about some important issues. But they do it playfully, usually and with mutual respect for each other's hard work. And so I want to make sure we get plenty of time for that. But I thought it would be fun to start. Valerie Naylor is going to come up in a short time. We're going to talk about how TR got onto Mount Rushmore, which is sort of an interesting story. And Valerie is going to take the lead on that. But I thought I would just start by sort of setting the table this morning by talking a little bit about how, how early in his life Roosevelt was predicted to become the president of the United States. It's a really interesting story because if you think about it, I mean, you say a couple of preliminary things about this. First of all, one of the th things you have to really watch for in history is the is what might be called the inevitability of retrospect. Now, we know how the story came out, but they didn't know how the story was going to come out. And so, to give you two quick examples, when we think of World War II, we think of the Battle of the Bulge, and in the history of World War II, we say, well, it was Hitler's last attempt to break out, and it was doomed to fail, and here are the reasons why. But of course, at the time, that wasn't so certain. And everything that I've read suggests that if Hitler had had a little bit more gasoline, that battle would have at least lasted a great deal longer with more loss of life. Or we think of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the inevitability of retrospect, but when the first test of the atomic weapon uh, occurred on uh, July 16, 1945. J. Robert Oppenheimer predicted that it would fail. Uh, if it had failed, the whole history of the end of World War II would have been qu quite different. Or just a third, we, we, with the inevitability of retrospect, we assume that Thomas Jefferson was the inevitable author of the Declaration of Independence, but it almost didn't happen. Jefferson was so diffident that he did not put himself forward, and he was such a homebody that he lingered back at Monticello until very late in the session of the Second Continental Congress. And they kept wondering where he was, and he finally turned up very late in the game, and they still gave him the opportunity as a young, relatively untried Virginia radical to write this document. So when we look at it, we think, well, of course, it's Jefferson. But he nearly lost that assignment because he was dilatory. And so, it's really important to remember how contingent history is and how things only gel when they gel. So let me just quickly look at, um, at when Roosevelt was first predicted to be president. I was talking to Professor Perry Arnold about this uh, just be before or after his talk the other night, and I said to him, uh, "Do you, if Roosevelt hadn't become vice president and McKinley hadn't been assassinated, do you think Roosevelt would certainly have become the president of the United States in 1904 or 1908 or at some point. And he said, no, it's, it's far from clear that he would have been president of the United States. And, and there are lots of reasons for that. He was a maverick. Uh, he, he, had, he, had, he was young. He had not um, paid his dues with the old stalwart Republican Guard. He wasn't a, seen as a completely reliable party man. Uh, there was this streak of impulsiveness uh, in his youthful character. And so it may be that if, there, if McKinley had not been assassinated, Roosevelt might not have become the president of the United States. It's, it's far from inevitable. And yet, from a very early time in his life, it was predicted that he was presidential material or that he might become president. And interesting, I was talking to Amy about this. Some people had sort of reckoned on this earlier, but really the first time that it was that it was boldly stated that Roosevelt was going to be president or could quite likely be president was here during his time in Western North Dakota. And I'll, I'll give you the anecdote in just a moment. 
I want to just go through a couple of earlier ones very quickly. In 1881, he was elected as the, uh, he was born in 1858. So in 1881, he was elected as the youngest member ever up till then of the New York State Assembly. He served three terms. And Puck, the, the magazine, Puck, the illustrated magazine, and by the way, we now have a set of it digitized at the Roosevelt Center um, in, in Dickinson, thanks to the Library of Congress. Puck said this of him um, in a kind of Puck, a Puck editorial. Be happy, Mr. Roosevelt. Be happy while you may. You are young. Yours is the time of roses, the time of illusions. Bright visions float before your eyes of what the party can and may do for you. We wish you a gradual and gentle awakening. You are not the timber of which presidents are made. That's 1881. He's just 23 years old. Um, and he's, he said later, I rose like a rocket. But he's already in his first term as a New York State Assemblyman, as a 23-year-old, already being debated a little bit about whether he's presidential material. And Puck tells him in no uncertain terms, you're not. Um, that's 1881. In 1883, he came here for the first time. He, came, uh, he arrived here on September 6th, 7th, um, came in late in the night of the 6th, early in the morning of the 7th, and arrived not here, but just across the river. So when you get out today, cross the river over to the other side, that's where the village of Little Missouri was, and that's where he he came to it at 2 or 3 in the morning on the night of 6, 7, September 1883 to kill a buffalo. There was no depot. There was no crew. They just stopped the train. He got off with a duffel bag and a rifle, and he dragged it across uh, the prairie to something called the Pyramid Park Hotel. He banged on the door. It took a long time for the intoxicated proprietor to open the door. Roosevelt said, I should like a room. And the proprietor said, there are no rooms, but there is a, what he called the corral, up on the second floor where there are 14 cots. One of them may be empty if you want it. It's two beds. And so here this New York patrician, Theodore Roosevelt, got his first taste of the West by sleeping in a room with 13 people he called the ruffians. Um, he went down to uh, a ranch uh, south of here to headquarter for his buffalo hunt. It's, it was the Gregor Lang Ranch. It's about 40 miles south of Medora. If you've been down to that part of the world, it's just north of Marmoth. It's on the mouth of the little Cannonball Creek. It's a very remote place. It's actually a ranch that's um, owned and operated by John and Nikki Brown, and the footings of the of the Gregor Lang cabin um, can be found, or at least one of them. But he headquartered there for a couple of weeks, and during that time he would go out by day. It was it was weather much like this, only rainier rather than snowy. But it was the, the prairie was covered with muck and gumbo, and it was his uh, guide Joe Ferris said, "There's no way you're going to get a buffalo. You should just quit." But Roosevelt wouldn't quit, and they went out day after day. But at night they would come back, and Roosevelt, uh, Joe Ferris would go to sleep. He was exhausted. And Roosevelt would stay up talking to Gregor Lang about politics, about ranching, about the West, about the prospects of this country. And after about six days of this, Roosevelt said, you know, Mr. Lang, I should like to invest in the cattle business. What would you recommend? And Lang suggested that he could talk to a couple of other ranchers, Sylvain Ferris and W.A. Merrifield, and that they might help him. And that's exactly what happened. That's how Roosevelt, on that first trip to the Badlands in 1883, decided impulsively to invest in a ranch, the Maltese Cross. And before he left, he wrote a check for $14,000, a very sizable amount of money, to invest in the first of what would be two ranches. But as he left after this two-week stay with the Langs in this hunting period. Gregor Lang, who was an immigrant from Scotland, who was here managing a ranch for a wealthy Englishman, Gregor Lang, when Roosevelt left, turned to his son Lincoln and says, there goes the most remarkable man I ever met. And he went on to say he predicted that we would hear great things about this Theodore Roosevelt. In 1886, a couple of years later, 
Roosevelt arrested the boat thieves up near Cherry Creek, near the north unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. The thieves had stolen his boat. <coughs> Instead of just letting them go, he decided to chase them down and arrest them. He built a boat in order to follow them through a blizzard. He finally caught up with them. He made a citizen's arrest. He had three desperados now on his hands, and he couldn't get them to Bismarck and Mandan to turn them into the law. So in desperation, he finally decided to march them overland from Kildare, North Dakota, from the Diamond Sea Ranch at Kildare, about 40 miles over that gumbo of Badlands country to Dickinson to the sheriff, and he did it. It was one of the great adventures and ordeals of his life. He went sleepless for three or four days. Uh, he, he couldn't tie up the death. He was all alone now. He'd sent his ranch hands back to the ranch. He was all alone with these three desperados, one of whom was known as Red-Headed Mike Finnegan. And at night he couldn't tie them up because he was afraid they'd get frostbite. And so his humanitarian instincts were at war with his law and order instincts. And so since he couldn't tie them up, he made them take their boots off so that they couldn't run away. But he had to stay awake. And he kept himself awake um, in typical Rooseveltian fashion by reading a book. He happened to have with him a copy of Anna Karenina by Tolstoy, um, one of the longest books ever written. And he had just been translated into English, and he read it out loud to the boat thieves for days, <laughs> stopping, he said, from time to time to engage in the little literary criticism, <laughs> because he wasn't really a fan of this Tolstoy, because Tolstoy, after all, wrote about adultery. And he finished the book. He actually read War and Peace, or Anna Karenina, cover to cover to the boat thieves. And then he ran out of book. And then the, even more improbably, he turned to red-headed Mike Finnegan and said, I say, old chap, you don't have a book, do you? And Finnegan had one. It was a dime novel about Jesse James. And so Roosevelt said, let me borrow it. I'll return it after you're released from the penitentiary. And then he read that out loud to the boat thieves. And so, whether all of this is strictly speaking true, we don't know, but this is the account he wrote of it, and Finnegan later became a kind of friend of Roosevelt's, and we happen to have the document in the Roosevelt Center of the letter that Finnegan eventually wrote from the penitentiary to Roosevelt, saying that if he had known that it had been Roosevelt's boat, he wouldn't have stolen it. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, but while he was in prison, he had been reading Roosevelt's writings, and he found him, quote, fascinating and would like to form a friendship with him. Anyway. When he got the boat thieves finally to Dickinson, he was as tired a young man as you could possibly imagine, and his feet were all torn up from all of this madcap hiking across the plains. And so he was walking down the street of, of Dickinson, which was then just a forlorn little uh, cattle village. Some of you, I suppose, may think it remains that, but, um, <laughs> but he was, I always, you know, I, I gave this talk recently, and it was about the agrarian vision, and, and uh, I reminded this audience that, that in North Dakota, and this is really true for the, our guests from elsewhere, in North Dakota, I grew up in Dickinson, a town then of 12,500 people, and the fact that I grew up in Dickinson is held against me from an agrarian point of view. That's regarded as an urban <laughs> situation in North Dakota. This would not be true in any other state, but if you come from a a megalopolis of 12,000 people, you're discredited from an agrarian point of view here. That, that tells you how, how puny we really are. Anyway, he gets, he, his feet are all torn up, and so he's walking down the street, and he, he comes to the first person, the gentleman he sees and says, can you point me to a doctor? And the person that he has chosen turns out to be the doctor, Dr. Victor Hugo Stickney. Um, and Stickney says, I'll take care of you. So Roosevelt goes off to his to his uh, doctor's shop, gets his feet bandaged and, and repaired a little bit, and then he goes off to a, a meeting that night at the uh, Little Missouri Cattlemen's Association here. But when he, this, is, this was um, Dr. Victor Hugo Stickney's account of Roosevelt. He says, he was all teeth and eyes, but even so, he seemed a man unusually wide awake you could see he was thrilled by the adventures he had been through. He did not seem to think he had done anything particularly commendable, but he was, in his own phrase, pleased as punch <laughs> at the idea of having participated in a real adventure. He was just like a boy. And then he goes on to say to his, his correspondent, we are going to 
precisely predictions of the presidency, but they're predictions of something stellar. Now, Perry Arnold said the other night, you know, it, it would have been possible that Roosevelt would have just been an imperial land baron, like so many others out here. Or it, at one point after the death of his wife, Alice, he thought he might live here permanently and leave New York behind. And there were, he, he said he might, when, when North Dakota finally became a state, he might wish to run for the Senate or to be governor or something. So he could have had a very interesting mid-level career. It would have been much more likely. But if he had, let's just assume for a moment that he had become a senator from North Dakota or he had, he had never risen very high, he had risen to some mid-level in American life, it would be a very different story not just because he wasn't president, but that, that sort of interesting and peculiar character set, impulsiveness, the, the heroic element, the romantic element, the, the, the quest for adventure, the physical um, capacity of, of Roosevelt. All those things, I hope, I, I hope you agree with this, I, all those qualities that make him so magical as a president, maybe the most unusual president in American history from that, perspective, would have been less interesting had he been a senator. It would have been kind of, we would have found it easier to dismiss that set of qualities had he been a senator, that he was a wild eccentric or an impulsive maverick. But when you get to be the president with that set of qualities, it changes the equation pretty considerably. And it, and it, it makes what could be a deficit character set in some respects become a magical character set because it's so out of character for the presidency. If you think of a presidency like Warren Harding or Calvin Coolidge or Rutherford B. Hayes, they're, they're stayed, they're in, they're in bodily, body control, they're sedentary people. They're people that are characterized by self-restraint. And then here's this cowboy maverick. And so that's part of what I think put him on Mount Rushmore. Well, he, on the basis of that meeting that he had with Stickney, which was in early April of 1886, Stickney invited Roosevelt to come give the 4th of July address in Dickinson that year. So just a few months later, the first ever 4th of July celebration in Dickinson. And I told you a little bit yesterday about what our plans are in sort of commemoration of that. We found the place where this occurred. So Roosevelt does come, and here's the story. He's in Medora. He's coming out on the 4th of July. It's 30, as you now know, it's 35 miles from Dickinson. He comes in that morning on the train, but there's no passenger train. So he comes in on the freight train in the morning with a couple of pals, but also including a frontier journalist from here, Arthur Packard, A.T. Packard, who had created the, the wonderful newspaper here, The Badlands Cowboy. And so Packard is about the same age as Roosevelt. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan. He and Roosevelt are friends. They're, they're both intellectuals, so they become close friends out here. And Packard travels with Roosevelt on a freight train from Medora to Dickinson for the 4th of July celebration. And there's a long and interesting account of that celebration. There were parades and there were um, bands and there were several speeches. Roosevelt gave the second of two patriotic speeches. The presiding officer of that 4th of July celebration in Dickinson was a man named Western Star. That was his actual name. And he was the sheriff. The sheriff Western Star. That's almost too good to be true. And maybe is. But he was the presiding officer. So then Roosevelt gives that speech in which he says, like all Americans, I like big things, big prairies, and so on. That kind of over the top this country is magnificent speech. But here's the upshot of it. As they are going back to Medora, this time he and A.T. Packard are on a passenger train, freight train to Dickinson, passenger train later that day back to Medora. All the way, Roosevelt is all hepped up from his speech, and so he's talking to A.T. Packard about government, about civil service reform and about America's place in the world and the need for a larger navy and the, 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 we, we, we can't have corruption and there are many problems that this country must solve and you just have this picture of him just jabbering the whole way from Dickinson to Medora and finally Packard says to him, uh, he says, if you continue along these lines, 
you will become the President of the United States. This is July 4th, 1886. Roosevelt is still in his 20s. Packard says, if you continue along these lines, you will become the President of the United States. And then Packard wrote about this letter. He said, he gave me the impression of having thoroughly considered that matter previously <laughs> and to have arrived at the same conclusion. <laughs> So this is 1886. In fact, I think I think she's going to do this heroic thing, and Roosevelt has already long since assimilated that. And then, but Roosevelt replies to him, "If your prophecy comes true, I will do my part to make a good one." Right. So there we go. So the, the 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 first certain prediction that we have of Roosevelt becoming the president of the United States was July 4, 1886, in Western North Dakota, by a frontier journalist, and the prediction turned out to be true. Here are just a couple of others. There's one little scene I want to show you from 1895 when he's the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner. But in 1901, William Allen White of the Emporia, Kansas Gazette wrote, and now he's just been made Vice President, he says, there is no man in America today whose personality is rooted deeper in the hearts of the people than Theodore Roosevelt. He is more than a presidential possibility in 1940, or 1904. He is a presidential probability is becoming the American of the 20th century. When he was um, just back from Cuba, after uh, his heroics there, and Boss Platt, Thomas Platt, was, was considering whether to promote Roosevelt for the governorship of New York, Platt, who was a very, very, very shrewd politician, said of Roosevelt, if he becomes the governor of New York, sooner or later, with his personality, he will have to be the president of the United States. I am afraid to start this thing going. <laughs> and he did start this thing going, and Roosevelt did move quickly thereafter into the, into the presidency. When he was a New York State Police Commissioner, his closest friend, Henry Cabot Lodge, Lodge really was his patron. He managed Roosevelt's political career. He, he, was his, he was his deepest promoter until at least 1912 when they broke over the Bull Moose campaign. But Lodge said to him when he became New York Police City Commissioner in, in a much more New England um, restrained way, he said to Roosevelt, quote, the day is not far distant when you will come into a large kingdom. And so he too is predicting that Roosevelt will certainly rise much higher than New York City Police Commissioner. I'll just close this with one more. This is, this is a marvelous moment when Roosevelt is the New York City Police Commissioner, the President of the Commission, He's, he's doing with that job what he does with every other one. He's making it a heroic job rather than a mild bureaucratic or administrative one. And two of America's greatest um, journalists, reformist journalists, Lincoln Steffens and Jacob Rees, Jacob Rees is actually Danish, um, are sort of are in, on, on the beat, on the assignment in New York, and they are young protégés or disciples or admirers of Theodore Roosevelt. And they come to see him every day to hang out and be with this, this, this man of destiny. And Jacob Reese actually becomes a very important figure in Roosevelt's life because he introduces Roosevelt to the, the world of the slums and the tenements. And if you remember, Reese wrote that extraordinarily important book um, about the cities, How the Other Half Lives, using the, a pioneering new technology, the flashball, to be able to take pictures inside these dank, gloomy tenements, and that book um, changed Roosevelt's life. In fact, he got a copy of the book that Reese sent to him, and he immediately the next day went to Reese's office and left a card saying, I'm Theodore Roosevelt and I'm here to help. And they became good friends. And Lincoln Steffens was another muckraker, a term coined by Roosevelt, and they used to come as young men to be with this other young man, Roosevelt, at the police commission headquarters. And here's, here's the scene, if you, if you know the story of Roosevelt. 1895, you've read this before. They decided one day, having read something um, in the commercial advertiser, that Roosevelt might be regarded as a possible next president after Cleveland, they decided to come in and tease Roosevelt. And so Lincoln Steffens and Jacob Reese come into his office and say, so, Commissioner Roosevelt, is it true that you have the ambition to become the president of the United States? And here's the account that Stephens wrote about it. Roosevelt jumped up from behind his desk, fists clenched, teeth bared, 
and he seemed about to throttle Reese and me. Don't you dare ask me that, T.R. yelled at Reese. Don't you put such ideas into my head. No friend of mine would ever say a thing like that, you, you. He calms down a little. He came back up to Reese. He put his arm over his shoulder, and then he beckoned Stephens closer and said, Never, never, you must never, either of you, remind a man at work on a political job that he may be president. It almost always kills him politically. He loses his nerve. He can't do his work. He gives up the very traits that are making him a possibility. I, for instance, I am going to do great things here, hard things that require all the courage, ability, and work that I am capable of. But if I get to thinking of what might it lead to, he stopped. He held us off and looked into our faces with his face screwed up into a knot. As with lowered voice, he said slowly, I must be wanting to be president. Every young man does, of course, but I won't let myself think of it. I must not, because if I do, I will begin to work for it. I'll be careful, calculating, cautious in word and act, and so I'll beat myself. See? Again he looked at us as if we were enemies. Then he threw us away from him and went back to his work. Go on away now, he said, and don't you ever mention that don't you ever mention that subject to me again. So isn't this interesting that here's this man, and, and I want when Perry comes back up, I want him to talk about this. It, it's not inevitable that he would have become the president of the United States. But he did become the president of the United States, and more than any other figure I know from our history, there were people predicting it from a relatively early age when he was in his 20s. And as we said before, he became the youngest president in American history at, at 42 years and 322 days. If you think about figures like this, how many people in the history of the presidency have been predicted to be president? Well, George Washington, but that doesn't really count because the country was very young then. But do you think Dwight Eisenhower was predicted to be president from his 20s? No. Jimmy Carter? Certainly not. Uh, George W. Bush? No. You know, no. James Madison? No. Warren Harding, though, you could make a list of almost every president that there was no prediction that this was going to happen. Their life reached a, some sort of a crossroads or some sort of a, a, a heightened moment, and then things changed. Dwight Eisenhower was a war hero. People come into the presidency for lots of reasons. The closest you could come in, in my lifetime, I suppose, would be John F. Kennedy, but as you know, his father predicted his other sons. He, he, Joseph Kennedy was to be the president of the United States. This is a very unusual thing. The, the presidency is largely a political accident. And most people who wind up there have paid their dues in all sorts of nondescript ways for a very long time. And then suddenly there is an effervescence that leads them into that office. But Roosevelt, at least since 1881, and maybe sooner, his, his his sister Corrine says that even as a child, they sort of said, oh, he'll be president. This is, of all the presidents on our history, I think this is the person who was predicted to be president from the earliest age, and yet he came in through the back door, and our eminent political scientist says he might not have been able to come through the front entrance. So we'll let that be the start of the conversation we have here in a minute.